where is that seafood coming from? Simply because it's wild caught doesn't necessarily mean that it was caught in a sustainable manner and in a clean environment. Why isn't wild fish necessarily better for us than and the planet, right? It's not just us and the planet than farm fish. Cause that's, uh, most people think that wild fish is better. And you're kind of going, wait a minute, there's some, maybe some issues with that. And, and right. let's talk about it. Yeah. It's one of those things that just has so much nuance to it, right? But if we want to address first the better for the planet, we have to think about the supply and demand. And the data is really clear that they're simply more demand than there is supply. The gross production of wild-caught seafood has not been increasing. It has actually plateaued and even started to descend uh, since 2002. There's not like a new source of wild-caught seafood that we're going to find. What, meanwhile, population is growing. Um, more middle class kind of affluence looking for healthier alternatives of, of protein and seafood is that generally. So there's just not enough seafood. But then the nuance is where is that seafood coming from? Simply because it's wild caught doesn't necessarily mean that it was caught A, in a sustainable manner and B, in a clean environment. So unfortunately, all rivers lead to the ocean and everything that uh, ends up uh, in the ocean is a lot. And that includes industrial pollutants and uh, toxins from uh, glyphosate. And there's just a myriad of things that are now affecting the oceans. Um, so um, coal fire plants, um, fertilizers and yeah auto um break dust plastics. all of these things are showing up <laughs> plastics. In the ocean. microplastics are a huge issue so yeah we can now test fish and see these elements in the food chain and so while there are beautiful places in the ocean we have to be really conscientious of where it's coming from and in general you know the reason ctop exists right now is to try to define create a new supply chain that is that is, you know, bringing better products. But I, I'm not saying that all wild caught fish is bad by by any means. It's just that we have to, you know, be yeah. looking at it a lot more mindfully. You know, not all, you know, wild pigeon is necessarily something that you want to consume. The same thing no. happening in the ocean. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, no, it's yeah. so true. I mean, I I've been to the Antarctica, I've been to the Arctic, and you think, oh, these are pristine environments. But when those um, populations of fish and uh, penguins are measured uh, in their whales. They're so toxic, even in these pristine environments. So we we really polluted the oceans in ways that we have just begun to understand. And uh, like you said, from coal effluent, from the microplastics, from the nitrogen fertilizers to the PCBs, the, all the things that just kind of pour into our rivers, lakes, streams, and oceans. I mean, in, yeah. in America, the lakes EPA too. said there was not... Lakes. I mean, I had a patient with terrible. severe mercury poisoning because he fished out of his lake in rural, like I think Alabama or something. And I'm thinking, wow. Yeah. But he, he, that everywhere is polluted, and yeah, you the can't levels get away from lakes it. are higher than the ocean in many cases. Yeah. It's Absolutely. I would never eat a lake fish or most river fish. In fact, the EPA says That's not to ever eat a river fish in America because it's full of mercury. Uh, so uh, the 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 environments it's hugely impacted by what we're doing industrially and the planet and. And a lot of fishing practices, um, you know, are, are problematic. And, and, and we think, oh, well, aquaculture is great. You know, we, we don't have to, we can grow fish in a way that, you know, we don't have to rip the, the original stocks out of the ocean. But, but a lot of aquaculture practices are really bad. And, uh, you know, I, I, and even things we think are good. I was in Turkey and I was, you know, in Bodrum, which is sort of on the coast of Turkey. It's beautiful between, you know, right off the, all the Greek islands and out, out in the ocean there, you could see these big aquacultures and they, they sell the, tuna? the, no, it wasn't tuna. It was like sea bass. And they, and they sell this stuff to Whole Foods as quote, healthy, uh, you know, safe fish. But I knew the people who were involved with it and, and, and had looked at it very carefully. And these fish were, were grown in horrible conditions, pump full of antibiotics, and were, you know, grown in highly concentrated ways in very shallow water. I mean, it was really bad. And, and yet they were sold as, quote, healthy options in Whole Foods. And I was like, whoa. And, and then they were talking about other forms of agriculture. I, I forget the name of it, but the concept was that you would, you would keep the fish, 
um, protected in a certain area and let them grow and grow and grow, but never fish. And then eventually the populations of fish would get so large in those areas, it would spill over outside of that protected area. And you could really harvest those fish and the original stock would keep going and keep spilling over the fish. So I'd love you to talk about the idea that we can do aquaculture as a way to fill the void uh, from the the um, increasingly diminishing uh, fish stocks around the world. Uh, you know, we're, we're really raping the oceans and not, not only, you know, we're just fishing, uh, you know, legally, but there's a lot of illegal fishing going on that's even making it worse. China and Japan and many other countries that are just, you know, don't care. So I, I think, can you talk about that a little bit? How do we, how do we uh, look at the pros and cons of, of aquaculture? Well, there's so many pros and then there's a lot of cons. And as you pointed out, like not all farms are doing it right. That, you know, the concept of aquaculture as a commercial business is relatively new. While aquaculture has been around for a millennium, you know, the Chinese practiced aquaculture, the Hawaiians still practice aquaculture to, to a, a certain extent. It's being revived. Uh, you know, once upon a time, Pearl Harbor was one of the largest uh, food production sites in the entire Pacific, you know, all fish ponds. Um, what's happening with aquaculture now, as it commercializes, is the first handful of aquaculture businesses that took outside investment essentially took money from big ag businesses. And that same business model was applied to aquaculture, where they just figured out, well, how do we maximize our profits and get uh, as little risk as possible and use the same tools, the you know the antibiotics, the steroids, the hormones, these are the things that allowed these fish to grow very rapidly, mitigate against disease and get as much profit as possible. But it wasn't, you know, that the objective was not necessarily to produce the best quality fish, the healthiest fish, the most um, uh, regenerative. And so that really stemmed from the objectives of those investors in that business model. But what we're seeing now is more nuance and more, um, types of farming, uh, catering to other types of consumers, consumers who are asking for something that is high in omega threes, not omega sixes, that is not depleting the oceans with fish meal and fish oil, um, raised in humane ways, harvested in humane ways. So the, the kind of maturity of the industry is starting to happen. And, and part of that, I think, is enabled because consumers are starting to ask more questions about the types of farming that is, in, that, that is happening with their beef and their chicken and their tomatoes. Yeah. We, you know, there's, there's a level of education with consumers now to where most consumers aren't just asking for USDA prime beef. They're asking for something that's grass-fed, grass-finished, pasture-raised cage free. These are the things that um, weren't talked about. It wasn't common uh, education lexicon of a consumer 20 years ago. We're starting to see that happen. And, I, and our hope and, and vision through education around aquaculture and, and bringing people to the farms and showing them, you know, the different types of feeds and, and methodologies of farming is that that terms like multi-trophic aquaculture and recirculating aquaculture systems and algae fed feed will become commonplace. That's kind of where yeah. we're going. Amazing. So in a way we're kind of maybe you still have some wild fishing, but you're saying the future of fishing is really around sustainable regenerative aquaculture. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. I, I don't think that, uh, that we need to stop fishing. I just don't think we should be, condoning industrial scale extraction of the oceans you know the evolution of our relationship with hunting evolving into cultivating and farming you know that was civilization we are still extracting massive quantities from the ocean even though those numbers are depleting and i think as we're now learning to work with the ocean Hopefully, we'll see more regenerative practices, as you were talking about, you know, marine protected areas. When you protect one area, identifying key habitats where, you know, over a large swath of the ocean, some areas are more important than others. Some areas are key breeding habitats or migratory paths. We protect mm. these key areas. The fish can come, they can spawn, they can breed, they can migrate. And then, yeah, it will spill over. We can maintain some sustainable levels and even help regenerate, but we have to change things significantly. And quite frankly, the transition to aquaculture done right 
has the potential to more than feed the world's protein needs. It's And it's happening whether we want it or not, simply because of the demand. What isn't for sure is if there's enough education and demand and desire to do it right, to have ed, have you know specific types of aquaculture really um, create a net positive impact on the environment before just industrial scale commodification of factory farms, you know, proliferate. I mean, I, I want to get back into the idea that, that doing regenerative aquaculture can be truly regenerative. In other words, a net yeah. positive to the environment, a net positive to climate, because that's, that's something new that I haven't really heard. Uh, but, but what I, what I want to sort of explore is this, is this idea that, and, and I think the wild fishing is a problem, and problem for me in, in, in many ways because of bycatch, which I want you to explain in a minute. And because we pollute the ocean so much that even if we're hunting and harvesting uh, wild fish in the proper ways, there's still a high likelihood that those fish are full of junk, like full of metals and, and petrochemicals and plastics. And, and so I always tell people like, eat the little fish, anchovies, sardines, herring, mackerel, you know, cause, sure. cause I see in my practice when people don't, I measure their heavy metal levels. They just kind of start to rise. So let's talk about one, the issues of, of what bycatch is, what industrial fishing is, um, doing to the planet and to our fish stocks and just kind of educate people briefly about sure. that. And then I want to get into this whole idea of like the bad way of doing aquaculture and cool. the right way. Yeah. 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 Well, if it, if it bleeds, it leads. Right. So like, shit, like that documentary sea spiracy got so much attention. Those are really great storytellers, really great filmmakers. They told a story that needed to be told. Uh, there's a lot of truth to what they're saying. Um, I think what they missed was identifying any of the solutions, right? So let's yes. talk first about uh, the, the the bleeding part. The bleeding part, you know, technology developed in war, like radar, is now being, imp you know, implemented uh, to identify where fish are underwater, you know, at massive scale. Um, you know, the largest uh, fishing fleets in the world uh, go out with multiple vessels and, helicopters to, to identify where the, the schools are. They have small speed boats that encircle the school, wrap their net around and capture the entire thing. What is in that is not just the target species, because when you're targeting an entire school, swimming alongside that school of tuna is going to be a myriad of other species that are cohabitating with them. And you can't discriminate between those. And by the time all of those fish right. are suffocated and brought on board through a purse staining net, the compression on those fish is just going to kill everything. So bycatch is the turtles, the dolphins, the seals, the non-target species of fish that were either too wow. small or too big um, that are going to just be off cast. And so bycatch is a huge issue. So that's one form of farming or, or excuse me, fishing, uh, purse staining. Yeah. It's generally considered uh, highly destructive. Um, yeah. Some people will try to argue that there's ways that you can target them, but it, you know, on an industrial scale, it's very difficult to target and be discriminatory because, you know, there's mm. times when we, you know, there's efforts, there's a saying in, in fishing, if the fish that are slow to grow, let them go because the largest mm -hmm. ones, the ones that grew really slowly and got there, if we just target those, we can wipe out the ones that are breeding and spawning at the highest rates. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes it's those largest ones. You take them out and you can really disrupt an entire population. So um, long lining is another form of fishing. So a line caught fish could be, you know, what you're familiar with when you romanticize the story of fishing with one line and one hook, but in industrial scale fishing, long lining means a, a line that could be mile or multiple miles long with literally thousands of hooks. And each yeah. one of those hooks is baited and set in the water for 24 plus hours. Anything that comes along gets, takes that bait is stuck on that hook and suffocates to death yeah. because by the time they come back and pull in that multiple mile long net, every, every hook that was baited has something on it. And invariably Ooh. it's difficult to identify what species that you're trying to target. They have things mm. called circle hooks where they endeavor to make it easier for some species to get off. But again, it's, it's really yeah. difficult to, to target certain species. 
you know, bottom trawling is another type of, of fishing, you know, where, you know, a, basically a rake goes along the bottom of the ocean, just catches everything that, you know, scrapes it up and disrupts the entire, uh, ecosystem you know these these vital parts of 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 the the sea floor are being completely disrupted and upended it's 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 akin to um slashing and burning in the rainforest it's it's super disruptive and you know there's efforts to to say like what is the maximum sustainable yield and you know they stop doing bottom fishing in certain areas and then it comes back a couple years later just to deplete it as soon as possible because Re- the reality is with industrial scale fishing, there's not enough fish in the ocean. And you have all of these boats and this established industry that frankly is subsidized and they're going to go out there and get as much as they can because they haven't been hitting their quotas in the past. And they just, they're depleting those, those quotas time and time again. Every year we're seeing shorter and shorter runs on, on, you know, the, the copper river salmon and all these different species. There's simply not enough to feed growing demand and, and industrial scale fishing is, is terrible. You know, I, and this is just in local waters, you know, I, when I sailed to the Galapagos, we're sailing along in a small sailboat and you come across a huge industrial scale fishing vessel with no AIS. So AIS is like a broadcasting (laughs) system. Well, essentially there's a, there's a requirement in certain, uh, by, by certain vessels to broadcast through satellite where they are, the name of the vessel, the direction they're going. But when they're, you know, under the, when they're, you know, doing things like illegally, they just almost, turn right? that off. Yeah. They it's literally, pirate ships. They, they're, they're pirating. They're in areas that are protected. They're not supposed to be fishing, but there they are. Incredible. Okay. So, so regular industrial fishing is a problem. And uh, aside from all the pollution in the oceans, it's overfishing fish stocks. But, but you know, one of the problems is, is is aquaculture because oh well, let's you know farm fish that's better. But the truth is that a lot of the aquaculture fish are fed fish from the ocean, fish that we wouldn't eat, right? But they catch those Sometimes. fish, they grind them up into pellets, and then they feed them to the fish. And it takes about ten pounds of what this bycatch and these other fish to create one pound of fish that we want to eat. <laughs> so, Sometimes, yeah. Yeah, it depends on the species, the feed conversion right? ratio. But yeah, absolutely. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah. It is a known issue with the industry, and there's been a lot of support for a transition, and a lot of progress has been made in that regard. For example, uh, you know, there was an FAO mandate, I think it was like five years ago, to reduce dependency on wild stock fish in aquaculture. And for the most part, that has happened very rapidly. Almost all of the largest... Uh, aquaculture uh, projects have transitioned to reducing their fish oil and fish meal use. And they've done that in a way that doesn't necessarily benefit humans, no health and nutrition. You know, they've said, okay, well, corn and grains, exactly. Soy. The, the oils from canola and soy are a lot, you know, are similar, you know, they're achieving some similar growth rates and whatnot, but um, they, they, they achieved the objective number one, which was reduce dependency on the bait fish. And yeah. absolutely that happened. And well, you are what you eat, but you're also whatever you're eating ate, right? So if these fish yeah, are eating that's so important. crab, you're, it's yeah. crap for you, right? Yeah. That's so important to acknowledge. Yeah. And, but I do have to at least acknowledge that, you know, these organizations set a goal to reduce impact on the oceans. And, it, you know, it really was it's the responsible the responsibility of you and I now to say, hey, we want better nutrition. Right. Because, mm. you know, aquaculture demand on wild caught seafood, aquaculture is necessary. And reducing impact on the oceans was necessary do we as consumers feel it's necessary to re- to reduce our intake of omega-6s and, and get better quality we have to voice that otherwise the industry is just going to keep doing what they do because there's tons of subsidies for corn and soy <laughs> so so just like there's a you know um conventional feedlot beef and agri- uh, uh, regular agriculture there's also feedlot fish <laughs> <laughs> you know, industrially yes. raised fish, which is in aquacultures. But there's also regenerative, which we'll talk about in a minute. But before we get to that, I kind of want to go into the dangers and the problems with 
feedlot fish and why we should be so concerned about it. What is the, uh, the conditions are grown in? What are the challenges they face? What does it do to the environment? What does it do to our health? What are the contaminants in there? So take us through that story of the sure. dangers of feedlot fish for us and the planet. Oh, wow. Well, you don't want to eat stress, toxins, and uh, bad uh, karma. <laughs> um, so, I mean, feedlot fish, you know, um, factory raised fish are, are similar to factory raised animals and, and factory raised you know, terrestrial farms, uh, you know, they're putting a lot of living creatures into a confined space and feeding them low quality diets that result in inflammation in their systems and reduced immune systems and higher likelihood of disease outbreak spreading through an entire population. And that is not cool to the fish. You have all of these living creatures living, you know, really uncomfortable lives, you know, high mortality rates. And, uh, also in high concentration, when you have an open ocean, uh, you have a, 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 an aquaculture site in shallow water, as you indicated there in, in the Adriatic Sea, I'm assuming, um, those, those fish, you know, they're effluent. You have just like a cattle farm with all of these cattle confined they're in poop. one small space. <laughs> Their poop is, it becomes toxic. And in, in, uh, a fish farm, the poop, uh, falling directly underneath in a shallow environment without enough uh, current and is this high concentration of nitrogen that can completely kill the sea floor. And there's so many organisms in, that are integral to the biodiversity of these ecosystems that are being destroyed because of poorly sighted, highly concentrated living creatures. You know, also what's going into the feed, you know, are you feeding them? You know, it's one thing to feed them the fish meal and the fish oil that's relatively natural for the environment, even though it's an overabundance of of concentration, but if you're feeding them antibiotics and hormones, um, it, that stuff then is in the effluent as well and going right back into the environment. So yeah, fish farms that are poorly sited using high concentrations, uh, high density, uh, intensive farming practices are, are bad for the environment and they're feeding the fish really low quality diets and it results in a quality of fish that, um, in, in some cases is probably on par with what consumers are looking for in at Ralph's or I don't, you know, you know, where, when they're buying their, you know, their factory farm chicken, you know, but in, in, in some cases it might even be healthier, you know, it might have a, a better profile and be more digestible, but is it really health food? Is it a superfood? Is it the potential of what seafood should be? It's definitely not the, you know, in line with the kind of Mediterranean diets that, that, you know, result in, you know, blue zones. So. Yeah. yeah. Incredible. So, you know, you're talking about these sort of intensive, almost like feedlot fish farms, uh, which, you know, the animals are, are fed weird food. They're, they're, poop is polluting the environment. They're maybe exposed to more drugs as, as part of dealing with growing these foods, antibiotics, hormones, yeah. but they're also exposed to PCBs and dachshunds and heavy metals and other things that are in the ocean. So it doesn't mean because it's farmed doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to have these things absent from the fish. Is that right? Yeah. PCBs are coming from the wild caught fish that are being turned into a fish meal. So the strange uh, karma of, of our human society is that we put all these PCBs into the environment, all of these, you know, um, fire retardants and whatnot, these chemicals that last forever are going into the food system. It's now, you know, these, these chemicals are being consumed by the zooplankton and the plankton, the phytoplankton and the, the anchovies. And then when a fishing vessel goes out and catches all of those and turns it into a fish meal and feeds it to a fish, they're getting a concentration of that. There's ways to remove it's it. Even worse. Innovative so like farms are doing it now, but yeah, yeah. that's the, the PCBs are a thing. Um, it's, it's in wild caught fish too, but it, it can be concentrated in, in, in a fish feed if you're not filtering it. There, there are technologies with centrifuges to, to, to pull You mean to get out, out but heavy metals and to get out yeah. the pesticides and the dachshund Absolutely. and the microplastics? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah. You know, reflecting on this conversation, I remember I traveled to Spain years ago and I encountered this fish farm called Veta La Palma. And what you're talking about in terms of most modern aquaculture is intensive fish farming or feedlot fish. Yeah. Uh, 
And Venla Palma is an extensive fish farm. And exactly. they essentially took 8,000 acres that was uh, an estuary and they yeah. had it, had it drained to become a cattle farm. That didn't work. So they, they kind of yeah. got it back and they hired an ecologist to restore the ecosystem. And they didn't really even have a hatchery. They just allowed the sort of natural processes to start to bring back the natural fish and the shrimp. And it was amazing because of this natural ecosystem they developed. They produced, yeah. you know, thousands of tons of fish. Um, in a much larger area, obviously, but the fish filtered all the estuary filtered out all the toxins. Mm -hmm. There was high levels of omega threes. There was yeah. uh, in, in incredible richness in the, in the sea bream yes. and the sea bass that they had in terms yes. of the, the quality, the, the taste, shrimp. and the fish. Really amazing. Dan Barber did a TED talk on it, the shrimp, and it was interesting. They said they measure the uh, quality of the ecosystem and the fish farm based on the health of the predators. And these flamingos would fly for like 150 yeah. miles just to go eat the shrimp. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And and they eat about half the shrimp, about 20% of the fish, but they still have the harvest enough to make it worthwhile. So they created this beautiful ecosystem. And essentially that's what regenerative agriculture is. It's restoring the natural ecosystem on the land. But you say yes. you can do that in the water too. Yeah. So yeah. how do we how do we move towards the the sort of natural uh sort of logical kind of conclusion here, which is how do we create regenerative agriculture that doesn't pollute the oceans, that creates healthy fish, that doesn't create fish with toxins that is is helpful to the environment that's not creating more destruction how, how can you take us through what what does that look like where is it being done what have you learned on your journeys i'm so glad that you brought up at the Palma because it's such a wonderful example and i hope that there's more you know i feel like the there's a, a film called the biggest little farm that was shot here in LA about this yeah. small farm. Yeah. I feel like we yeah. need a story like that about Beta La Palma and other yeah. like, like players yeah. that are really endeavoring to, to, to be good partners with, with the ocean and Beta La Palma not only is, you know, producing fish that are for human consumption and those flamingos are coming and, it, and they didn't just regenerate that estuary estuaries are key habitats and breeding grounds for a lot of fish that go out back out to the ocean. So there's a lot of, you know, species like, you know, halibut and various other species, they come up into these estuaries. That's where they breed. That's where they spawn. And then those species go back out into the ocean. So just creating that habitat and having the right symbiotic partnership between those plants, between the algae, between the uh, bacteria that are in those estuaries, they're able to bioremediate, to rebuild that habitat and create healthy biodiverse ecosystem for other species that are going back out into the ocean. So it is a great example. And absolutely the same theories are being applied in open ocean aquaculture as well. The symbiotic partnerships, the players that are involved in that permaculture operation in the ocean are a little bit different. You don't necessarily have the estuary plants in the ocean but there's other plants and organisms that will filter the dissolved dissolved particles and and the nitrogens and the particulate. So in the ocean, you're going to be uh, partnering kelp and shellfish and sea cucumbers with fish, and those sort of partnerships create the balance of nutrients, filter feeding, photosynthesis. Um, that that can create a healthy, balanced ecosystem. So that's kind of uh, that's, that's amazing. In in, in the scientific, so terms can it be a carbon waffles. sink in a way? Can it be a carbon sink as 100%, well? Hundred percent, hundred percent. So it, yeah, clean, between, it filters and cleans the ocean. It creates a carbon sink. It creates healthy fish that are more nutrient dense. It's like a it's like a win win win. The ocean is the largest carbon sink on the planet, and it is, when we yeah. invest and in help foster mechanisms that can scale ocean-based carbon sinks, it's some of the most powerful mechanisms for, for carbon sequestration on the planet, for sure. That's pretty amazing. Uh, and, 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 um, you know, the, the, the regenerative aquaculture, um, is, is sort of a new idea, really. It's sort of emerging from this kind of mess of fish farming and harvesting fish in a, ways that are destructive to the environment and to the fish populations. Um, and, and getting away from this sort of commodity production. So the question is, is it possible to scale this up? I mean, it, maybe Veta La Palma is a cute little sort of hobby fish farm in Spain and it creates delicious fish, but it's, it's kind of like, you know, is that really going to meet the demands of billions of people on the planet for seafood? And yeah. how do we, how do we kind of take this idea and can it scale? 
Yeah, absolutely. People could ask the same questions of, of regenerative cattle farms, you know, like, is it scalable? And, and I, and I think it absolutely is. It's just, we have to have a different distribution model and a different incentive model and a relationship to where our farms are. Right. It's very difficult to scale a massive industrial scale monoculture and uh, do it in a truly sustainable regenerative manner. But those systems were built for our current distribution platform, right? It's kind of an economic uh, vehicle that will move massive quantities of commodity products quickly through these kind of distribution channels. If we're going to the centralized distribution channels, in order to transition to supporting lots of small regenerative farms, artisan farms, a distributed network needs to establish. So how do we plug in these sort of distributed networks to support these farms or have enable these farms to support their local ecosystems, their local uh, communities? And that I think absolutely is scalable. I mean, it happens in nature. Nature it is absolutely abundant. The abundance in nature when done, when allowed to you know, have these sort of symbiotic relationships produces, you know, biomass, you know, that, that could easily feed the world if done correctly. So yeah, scalable. Yes. Uh, easily to easy to plug into the existing distribution channels. No, very difficult. Um, so that's why there's kind of this, this hiccup, right? Like, um, aquaculture farms have grown to sell their products into existing systems. Those systems were really asking for, commodity products that were cheap and available in large quantities in order to fulfill demand and current, um, you know, format spec. So are you saying, are you saying we need to eat different kinds of fish than we're used to eating and get used to different kinds of seafood or, or, or... I'm saying that, uh, it's difficult to buy it's difficult for Whole Foods, for example, to support lots of small farms. If you go to Whole Foods, it's really hard for to know what farm the fish came from because their distribution model makes it difficult for them to support individual farms by name because they're constantly buying from different farms and different suppliers. And so it's this commoditized system. If you go to a, your farmer's market, you can ask specific questions because they're not this, you know, they're not commoditizing their products. Yeah. I mean, you can't, it's a traceability and transparency is the problem, right? We don't know where our food comes from. And, you know, it could yeah. come from some horrible, you know, Vietnam fish farm where they're growing shrimp and it's full of crap and oh, yeah. like, oh, this is shrimp. It's healthy, but actually maybe it's not. Yeah. Um, so I, would, I, I would like to say there are in Vietnam some fair trade farms that are doing it right, that are doing yeah. extensive farming where they're preserving mangroves. So, you know, we have these, we have the traceability even in those places is absolutely cornerstone because we need to support those farms in Vietnam as well that are doing mm. it right. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> so I, I, I want to kind of veer off a little bit on a topic that always is sort of uh, in conversation these days. We know about heavy metals, we know about mercury and fish, PCBs, but microplastics is a little bit of a new concept. Uh, and, and there was a UC Davis study that found one in four fish have microplastics in them. I think it might be even more than that. So can you talk about what are microplastics? Where do they come from? How do they get in fish? And what are the health consequences of us consuming fish with microplastics? I, I mean, I've had some people say, some dietitians and nutritionists say, don't eat any fish because it's full of microplastics. And even the benefits of the fish are going to be outweighed by the harms of the microplastics. So what do you think about that? Uh, well, I, I'll address how it gets into the fish, and I'd be more than happy to talk about that study. I think it's really important. We need more studies on this. Uh, but uh, then I might turn it back to you because, I, I, you know, your opinion on, on the health benefits and how it outweighs. I think, you know, that's, that's yeah. an interesting question, you know. There are ways to mitigate exposures to microplastics, you know, where you raise the fish, what goes into yep. the fish, kind of, you know, that's what aquaculture is all about, controlled environments, controlled feed. But to address uh, wild-caught seafood, that study, uh, UC Davis went to fish markets all up and down the Pacific coast um, and bought wild-caught local seafood. And then the study looked at the presence of microplastics, both in the stomach and in the flesh. And they found that there was microplastics in 25% of those fish. Microplastics are not, um, you know, 
visible size pieces of plastic. It is what happens when plastic degrades over time and it starts to decompose and it turns into these small particles that are mistaken by the zooplankton and other small creatures as food because oftentimes they're you know attracting other algae and what and it might be growing on it and it gets consumed and it's not digested and it's bioaccumulating just like mercury into the food system it's going from one mm -hmm. fish up into the next and mm -hmm. it's now in our food system um yeah it's it's really difficult to remove as well there's wonderful projects out there right now like the ocean cleanup project that is taking all of the you know plastics out of the, the pacific gyre there's so much plastic in the ocean now like the you know that the, there's reports that there's you know we're on track to have more plastic in the ocean than fish that wow is you know <laughs> that all of that plastic is breaking down into these micro particles it's sort of possible to clean up the large particles but once it breaks down into these small particles it's almost impossible you know it just yeah we're going to put your whole uh, the whole ocean through a, a water filter <laughs> yeah and it's already in a lot of the food systems right so it's you know it's essentially laying down this new layer of petroleum products you know that'll be mined at some point in the future yeah it's it's a shame um you know we have to hold uh these plastics producers responsible it's a it's a it's a really you know it's it's we can't keep putting plastics in the ocean plastics are mm. going into the oceans through myriad ways it's you know sometimes it's just large pieces of plastics sometimes it's you know the micro particles in in uh in makeup or or things that are going into the storm drain but it's really difficult to remove it once it's in there and now it's yeah it's absolutely in the food system and it's not just near rivers it's in the open ocean it's in the bottom of the Himalaya you know it's the top of the Himalayas and it's the bottom of the Marianas Trench so yeah wow. how does it affect humans I, I you know it's it's definitely uh there's some studies of, about that and i'd be curious to hear what your your doctor friend said but uh it's definitely not good for us especially somebody who's you know trying to avoid exposure to petrol chemicals and mm. uh and their yeah. effects on on hormones and things of that nature yeah um yeah i don't think most people understand that plastic plastic comes from petrochemicals it's like an oil-based product right yeah yeah and then how is that affecting our hormones and our thyroid and all these other things it's, it, there's there's some studies that are really alarming um i try to be an optimist you know i have friends who still you know i used to spear fish now i go and i shoot photos of fish because i've kind of transitioned to not wanting to partake in that but i do have friends who still you know catch fish in the ocean and and consume it. And I, I still believe, I try to be optimistic that there, that there is a healthy consumption and some of the benefits like the omega threes, uh, and the selenium outweigh some of the, the, the challenges with, with mercury and, and plastics. But, um, it, it's not the same as when you and I were kids mm -hmm. or our grandparents or our ancestors, the, 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 uh, the accumulation of toxins from the industrialization of hum humankind is now all in our food system, unfortunately. No, it's terrible. Yeah. You know, what, what's really exciting to me is that, you know, you're not just sort of bringing to light the challenges of conventional industrial fishing or the dangers of conventional aquaculture and feedlot fishing, fish farming, um, and the potential benefits, but you've actually helped us because, you, you know, you found out if, if, if we do aquaculture right, that we can produce seafood that's measurably better through high omega-3s, lower heavy metals, PCBs, than 99% of wild-caught fish, and also provide a lot of benefits to the environment and be sustainable to eat and scale and make more protein, which is amazing. And you created this company called Seatopia, um, which is, I love the name. <laughs> um, it's like the opposite of sea spiracy, right? Or um, sea apocalypse, yeah. which is kind of we're in now. And, and um, you know, I'd love to hear sort of how the idea came about. You, you sort of you how you test food, and and what you found in this journey of yours, and and how we begin to sort of shift our consumption to, you know, yeah. support places around the world that are doing it right. Yeah, Seatopia uh, was an evolution from uh, this need to create that economic feedback feedback that directly supports farms. So. I was working with a farm that was producing some of the best quality yellowtail in the world, and they're 
distribution like every other farm was through a distributor who just commoditized the product and wasn't telling the story of that farm. And so even though yeah. they're producing the best quality product in the world, using the best quality feeds and, and harvesting in a very humane way, their product was literally put into a bucket with other farms that were doing it in inferior quality. And, and then the, the restaurants at the end wouldn't actually know which farm it came from or why it was inconsistent in quality. So uh, we started uh, importing, uh, whole, bringing these, these whole fresh fish direct to restaurants, some of the best farm to table restaurants in Southern California. And then we started bringing the chefs to visit the farms. Mm. The chefs got to eat the feed and swim with the fish. And then we started working with other farms and this, uh, this direct connection to, to the best farmed fish in the world um, was just such a beautiful, true, authentic relationship. And uh, at the same time, we had consumers, friends in the, in the community and, and our network who were aware that this quality of fish was just so much better than anything else that they were buying yeah. at, you know, the, the, these restaurants, these high end restaurants like Spago and, and Hotel Bel Air and, and consumer people would stop our de delivery van and be like, I want that fish for my want house. That. <laughs> they hijacked that it and it was going to the restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> Literally had people like, can I just buy a fish? But that's a, that it's not really scalable to send whole fresh fish, you know, to your door. Um, and so the idea of how do we get a, with integrity, how do we bring truly sustainable, regenerative seafood to people's doors so that you don't have to go to those fancy restaurants that you can actually eat it as part of your daily meal planning. And so Seatopia was really evolved from that, but it didn't kick off really until, um, till COVID because during, uh, prior to COVID, there just wasn't an appetite or enough appetite or enough conviction uh, from from the marketer, from our investors, that people would buy seafood online. Um, but uh, during COVID, uh, the, this the opportunity to continue to support these farms that at the moment didn't have any of their food service sales channels, um, they still had all these living animals that needed to be fed. And you know, how do we keep these businesses alive? Well, Seatopia is during COVID created that continued that cycle and was able to, to grow and build a, a sales channel that directly supports small farms um, is providing a layer of traceability on the mercury testing and other testing. So we, we take a sample of every lot that comes in uh, it goes to a third party laboratory FDA approved and quantifies the presence of heavy metals and things of that nature. Um, Everything is vacuum sealed so that it's freezer safe uh, and packaged in totally eco-friendly packaging mm -hmm. and shipped to the consumer with dry ice. And it's all sushi grade. And the idea is that doing this short distribution, short supply chain between the farms, not a bunch of middlemen, uh, having full traceability and transparency allows consumers to say, I liked this fish. Um, I want to buy more of this particular farm. I want to support this farm and I want to go visit it as well. And if there's an opportunity to do a dinner at that farm next year, I'm going to put it on my calendar and we're going to, you know, make a vacation to go visit that La Palma or this farm in Norway or Hawaii or Costa Rica. We're, we're working with some of these beautiful farms here in the United States as well, but this connection to where your food comes from, knowing who the producer is and saying, with your dollar every month, I want to support that business, that particular farm, because I understand their farming practices. They're using uh, algae-based feeds. They're doing recirculating aquaculture. They're using low-density farming. They're harvesting in a humane mm. way. I understand that, and I want to vote for that. And that's kind of the idea of Cetopia is that we can create this distributed network that will support lots of small farms and connect them to consumers. Um, hmm. yeah, it's like a CSA of sorts, but, yeah. uh, <laughs> and yeah. FSA, right? <laughs> Fish <Yeah>. supporter, <laughs> or something yeah. like that. Um, yeah. it's, um, it's quite amazing. Actually. I, I've been lucky enough to get a box of this fish and it's just 
phenomenal. I mean, I, I, I it's really good and it's unusually good <laughs> compared to the fish you normally would get. Even what you think is like, okay, I'm getting this farm in Norway or whatever. Like it, it just, it's just next level. And I, I'm very impressed. And I, you know, I, I worry about seafood and I, I kind of can relax a little bit when I have this fish. Um, and I, and I want to talk about some of the fish forms, you know, you know, tuna is a big thing, but I tell my patients never to eat tuna. Um, Will I eat it occasionally? Maybe if I like one piece of like Toro tuna sushi like once a year and I'll take a detox pill after, you know, <laughs> uh, but, but, uh, there, there's, um, fish like Kampachi, which can be raised with little or no mercury and, and without plastics. And, yeah. you know, how, do, how does that, how does that happen? How do you do create this sort of, cause you don't think like tuna, these big fish, how do you, how do you do that yeah. in a way that doesn't create these problems? We were thinking about putting, uh, a, a page on our on our website that said like you know click here for tuna and then you'd get there and it'd be like sorry <laughs> tuna is not part of our system yeah because yeah, unfortunately yeah. it's simply not the a, a species of fish that has a uh metabolism that is sustainable to farm they, they just yeah. have these high blood pressure warm blooded creatures with tons of energy that are used to just gobbling up massive quantities of fish and never stop swimming. And they just burn through calories nonstop. It's not a good model for raising fish. A kampachi absolutely uh, is a model. So not all fish are good models of sustainable businesses or sustainable aquaculture. Um, there are people who farm and ranch tuna but the feed conversion ratio, the amount of fish that goes in to produce one pound of fish with a tuna is generally around 20 mm. to one. And wow. that conversion ratio is just such a waste. Not Whereas sustainable, with, yeah. Yeah, and the, the, the dynamic of the way the fish grow and live and expend energy, you know, how active are they has a direct relation to that. So Kampachi, for example, um, convert fish uh, feed uh, closer to one to one. So they produce still a meat that's comparable to tuna, especially comparable to like a yellow fin. It has that like meatiness. It's, you know, it's, it's yellowtail. If you go to, to, if you ate sushi, you know, hamachi, hiramasa, kampachi are all in the yellowtail family. And it's a delicious, hearty, but fatty, luscious piece of butter. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. And it can be Amazing. raised in a sustainable manner and they can be adapted to unique diets. So a diet based on an algae uh, is something that they're happy to consume, have great health on. Uh, tuna are so finicky, it's difficult to get them to eat anything other mm. than whole sardines. And that's just not a sustainable way yeah. to, to raise an animal. So we're, we're working with farms that have, that are identifying the most efficient types of fish and shellfish and kelps and algaes in order to create this food system that is sustainable to feed them uh, with ingredients that are sustainable, that are healthy for us, that are not using antibiotics or hormones or GMOs. And that process is something worth celebrating. You know, there are yeah. farms that are worth celebrating and that's what we're trying to do. I'm not saying that that's all amazing. farm fish is, is, is great. I'm just saying that there are farms that are doing it right, that are sustainable, that are implementing regenerative practices, that we should be celebrating those individual farms yeah, I mean, I, I, I yeah, tell us about that because I, I got a package and I got this like kingfish, which I'd never really eaten before, and it was so delicious. But and, you know, tell us about some of the farms that you've found that that are great, and just give a flavor of, of what you've learned and a couple of examples, and then we can, I want to talk about a couple of other key issues before we close. Well, let, let's start with the, the kampachi, for example, which is similar to a kingfish. So you have in the Jack family, Seriola lalandi, Seriola rivoliana, Seriola quinta something. Uh, the, these, these jacks are all cousins. They can be raised in very similar conditions. Um, generally, so the, there's a kampachi farm that I spent eight years with in uh, working with in the Sea of Cortez. They started mm. by capturing a couple of wild caught fish, this wild Almaco Campachi in Mexico, they call it Pez Fuerte. They catch these wild fish. They put them into a land-based pool. 
about 15 at a time into these pools. The pool is in an in indoor building where they uh, regulate the amount of light and the temperature of the water uh, to trick them into thinking it's spawning season. When they mm. spawn, they uh, the fertilized eggs uh, float up to the top. The fertilized eggs are set aside. They're they're uh, they're raised, cultivated on rotifers, sea monkeys, and and a super healthy diet until the the fingerlings are large enough to be put back in the ocean. So with 15 fish at a time in these land based pools, over the last let's call it. Uh, five years, a hundred wild caught fish have been taken out of the ocean and they've produced a million fish or more from wow. each fish producing hundreds of thousands of offspring. Right. So the model is totally regenerative. Kind of like you Genghis Khan. A wild caught <laughs> fish. <laughs> yes, he spread his seed everywhere, far and wide. Exactly. And, and fish in the wild have this uh, survival mechanism. They are producing sometimes hundreds of thousands, if not a million seed offspring. And in nature, only 1% will survive. But in aquaculture, you can create survival rates as much as, you know, 90% or even higher, 99%. And as long as those fish are being fed a GMO-free, antibiotic-free, hormone-free diet raised in deep water, open ocean pens, low density, lots of current, it's a beautiful way to raise fish. You pair it then with some algaes like the, the kelps and the shellfish in proximity. They're cleaning the water. They're sequestering the carbon. And it's a synergistic um, way to, to work in the ocean. We're working with a, a farm in Peru that's raising these beautiful scallops that um, yeah. are raised. I just got some. I'm going to have them tonight for dinner, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to love them. They're sweet. They're sushi grade. They come in the half shell. You literally can just, you know, thaw them out, hit them with a little bit of olive oil, salt, citrus, and just have them raw like that Peruvian style. Mm. You can cook them. I would recommend not overcooking them. If anything, you just kind of want to sear the outer edge for textural contrast, mm. but you want to mm. capture the raw omega threes because these are literally taking they're just they're just filtering the water. They're just taking nutrients from the midwater column, filtering it, and and turning it into this beautiful, luscious, omega-rich you know piece of protein. And they're also when they're creating those shells, they are sequestering carbon from the ocean, from the atmosphere, mitigating against ocean acidification. You know, sequestering carbon. They're hanging lanterns, so they're hanging the midwater column in these lantern baskets. They're not on the ocean floor, so they're actually creating a really rich uh, uh, ecosystem that creates a little habitat for a myriad of other little species, uh, fish and and shrimp and all these other organisms be living around there. So these types of farms are part of the solution, you know. And if we if we go back to the the, the sea spiracy story. You know, they talked about aquaculture as like this bad thing. They didn't, they, their objective was not to highlight any solutions. Their objective, no. just like they did with cow spiracy, was <laughs> yeah. to just, you know, have people all a riled vegan up. solution, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, but right, right, there right. are solutions. And what we're trying to do with Cetopia right. is not say that, you know, that everything is bad. We're just saying vote for your dollar for food systems that are in line with your values and help support a transition to a blue economy to, 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 because we're on the blue planet. There's a lot of blue space. If we can use that to efficiently build a relationship with this planet that is symbiotic and, and help regenerate those, those systems, those ecosystems and turn on those carbon sinks, it can be a Cetopia on this planet. We can do it right. It starts with people just caring enough to vote with their dollars because Every single day, three times a day, we're spending money on all these food systems that are just canola and soy. And, you know, we can do better. So how do we buy foods that are one step better? I'm not saying it has to be perfect today, but like take Amazing. little steps, vote for the better ones and, and, and care. It's incredible. I mean, it's really quite incredible because, you know, you, you're, you're sort of mapping out a vision, which is kind of a, a more utopian idea of how do we live in harmony with the oceans? How do we generate food for us in ways that are good for us and good for the planet? Uh, and I, I honestly, you know, before I kind of came upon you, I, I sort of seen it done in bits and pieces, but to really uh, have the scope and vision that you have is, is quite 
refreshing and hopeful. Um, the, the, a couple of things I want to talk about. One was policy issues and, and, and obstructing this and what we need to do to fix that. And two is, is the issue around the supply chain of food that you need to feed these fish and how to, cause, that, cause that's a problematic area. I mean, it's great to do it properly, but you know, it matters what you're feeding them, feeding them soy and corn and canola and all this stuff. That's really bad news. So how do we create a sort of sustainable and healthy supply chain for these fit farm fish to eat? Because we're not only what we're eating, we're eating whatever we are eating ate. 100%. <laughs> right? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so should we address policy? Policy is a big one because, um, you know, we have these organizations like NOAA uh, that is trying to create um, sustainable oceans and, uh, you know, ec- economies that are that are healthy, depend- you know, healthy waterfronts. And NOAA for years has been trying to get aquaculture permitted concessions in, in, in continental United States, you know, and frankly, they've been blocked for the last, you know, 20 years. If we look at California, for example, there's no aquaculture permits for uh, fin fish that have been approved. Um, policy has been blocked, even though this is a government organization by uh, environmental groups. And I think that it's, you know, it's this black and white perspective that that seaspiracy and these uh, and films like that put out there that it's all bad. Well, you know, th- we have examples of mussel farms uh, and scallop farms and oyster farms creating these resilient habitats, and we have examples of kelp farms. But what are people eating every day? People are buying salmon, right? So how do we marry and support policy that says, if you want a, a, a concession for a fin fish aquaculture, it has to have a symbiotic partnership in a kelp and a shellfish farm and have the right controls in place to, uh, to monitor for and improve the environment. And that's absolutely possible. And there's examples of it happening in other parts of the world. Let's get it local. There are examples of U.S.-based aquaculture projects on land that are doing a great job uh, recirculating aquaculture systems and large uh, hydroponic systems. Uh, we're working with uh, some, some people in the Midwest that have a huge aquaculture system that uh, the effluent then feeds all of their uh their hydroponic lettuces and the whole thing mm-hmm. is, is, is tied together. It's really beautiful. It's also still relatively expensive to do that sort of farming. The oceans are in theory, a great way to raise fish because the, the, the fish are floating. They're not, you know, holding up their body weight. So they're efficiently creating protein. They're not using any uh, land resources, not using any fresh water. So if done right, we can build very robust, healthy food systems in the ocean. So I think we need policy that supports um, a resilient food system where we're not importing all of our resources from around the world, uh, where we can site it um, locally, have farms in each geographic region that supports those uh, those economies and those those communities. So yeah, policy is a big one. Um, yeah, it's 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 been a roadblock. It's been a roadblock to the scalability. If you look at uh, a macro level in the world, the United States rates seventeenth in the world for aquaculture production. We're still importing massive quantities of seafood from around the world. So because of this deficit, in some regards, you could say that it's a it's it's uh, you know builds you know, resiliency for our economy and for our food systems to have our own dependency. Uh, it also just makes sense uh, to, you know, to, you know, have these foods being produced closer to the, uh, to the, to the markets. And then there's the, the future is bringing a lot of it into vertical land-based farms as well. There, there's a lot of progress happening there. So, but again, the, the cost of producing it by, by, by the, by date from day one, Aquaculture in the ocean was already a vertical farming and working in three dimensions. So you have this massive biomass potential, uh, then replicating that on land. Still, you're using the, the water and the land resources. But um, yeah. that's a thing. Well, you, you, your work is really tremendous. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about feed. I, and I want to kind of tell people about how to get this because it's so great. So the, the transition of, of feed and aquaculture really went from, as we talked about before, 
um, fish meal and fish oil produced from anchovies and, and sardines being ground up and then extracted for oil and whatnot. And then the FEO and a couple other organizations said, let's reduce our dependence on, on wild feed, wild fish, and produce those oils and proteins with something else. And the most affordable things were these GMO corn and soys who are already being produced in industrial scale quantities and subsidized. And so those components started making their way into feed. And you started seeing actually in aquaculture studies and, and lab tests, the uh, omega-3, omega-6 ratio starting to change because when you start um, reducing fish oil and fish meal and replacing it with canola and soy, you know, they're the, the fish, you can't go too far because the fish it digestive, just like you and I gets inflamed and it has the same exact responses and it started to go down, but they're doing it to, you know, address a certain need. What we're seeing now is more and more, um, support for the base level organisms. So microalgae is where fish originally got their omega threes. So, yeah, right. Um, sardines and anchovies don't produce omega threes. They're produced no. through, Microalgae, these little, tiny, beautiful, incredible creatures. So these tiny little creatures are producing the omega-3s. Now what's happening is there's enough demand to support the commercialization and the economies of scale to make it affordable for feeds to actually be produced with algae-based feeds and other novel mm. things like insect-based feeds. Yeah. And, you know, and it's not just the traditional chlorellas and spirulinas, which, you know, are still relatively expensive. There's like really unique ones like uh, schizokitia uh, is this, this species of algae that uh, grows in like mangrove estuary environments that uh will that breaks down plant matter and it, it in 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 its original uh e ecosystem you know you would have like a flood tide and then there would be an abundance of plant material and then the tide would would ebb back out and then it had nothing to consume so it evolved to quickly metabolize a bunch of this plant matter and then store it as omega threes, and and this particular algae produces both EPA and DHA, DHA which is yeah. beautiful because now you can you can you can grow and ferment these in industrial scale productions and have a concentration of omega threes in the form of EPA and DHA, and specifically formulate feeds that are going to boost omega three levels in fish, so that you can quantifiably in a lab test show a salmon raised on this algae-based feed can have a higher level of omega-3 than the average wild-caught salmon. And you can do it in a way where it doesn't have any PCBs or any other heavy metals. And this model is happening now. It's just a matter of whether or not consumers are going to demand it. They're going to put up their hands and vote for it because it's still a, a financial thing. It's a, it's a return on investment. A farm that is currently selling 99% of its supply into a market like a Costco or Whole Foods where those things aren't being valued, they're not going to invest in that, right? So consumers need to stand up and say, I want the algae-based feeds. I don't want soy and corn. I want no GMOs. I don't want antibiotics. I want the superfoods, right? So how do we produce the superfoods? Yeah. And and I think we can we're starting to see that, right? Like that's what we're trying to do with Cetopia is support the best farms in the world that are actually making those innovations that every year have changed the ratios and what they're feeding their fish and improving it every single with every cohort. If you love that last video, you're gonna love the next one. Check it out here. There are so many factors that are involved in what's happening with our metabolism, our cell biology, and you really need to dig deep and ask those questions and have time with the patient or the patient needs to have this baseline understanding to even under, to even go 